Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the Meeting Room Sunday School class at Waverly Road Presbyterian Church. Today, we're beginning a new curriculum. We're beginning the spring quarter of 2021, a new study for this quarter um, on the faithful prophets of God's covenant. But before we get into details, let's open with a prayer. Dear gracious God, we thank you for the blessings and opportunities that we enjoy, for the technologies that we can be together even in these troubling times, for the assurance that you're here with us no matter how we gather, that your spirit is within us. And, and when we share with each other by technologies or in person, we know that, that you are with us and connecting all of us. And we just ask for you to be here today, open our hearts and minds to what you have to say to us through these studies and help us to understand the prophets that came before and how we can be more faithful prophets to your word. We ask that you remind us and help us to love strongly with all our heart and all our soul. Amen. So our, our new study for this quarter um, has three units. The, the three units are faithful prophets, which we'll do in March. In April, we'll study prophets of restoration. And then in May, we will study faithful prophets of change. And so in, in this first unit, we're going to start out with um, a study about Moses. And Unit one is four sessions drawn from Exodus, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and First and Second Kings. Um, it explores the reasons prophets were necessary for ancient Israel. Um, today we'll be talking about Moses leading the people out of Egypt and fulfilling God's promise to bring the people back to Canaan. Um, God's promise to give them prophets who will speak God's word to them after Moses, and then stories about Joshua, Huldah, and Elijah um, will illustrate the fulfillment of God's promise given through Moses. And so I look forward to, to this quarter, and, and hope you all can join us each, each week. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jack to talk a little bit okay. about what is a prophet. Yeah, thank, thank you, Howard. Well, I think that's a good question and a good starting point. How would you define an Old Testament prophet? One definition that I found that I really like is, is this. A prophet is a person who is chosen by God to speak for God and to be a provider of instructions to the Israelites about their righteous behavior. Uh, now, there, you know, there are many prophets in the Bible. Some are called major prophets, others are called minor prophets. I suspect in the history of Israel, there were a lot of prophets that didn't make the Bible as we know it today. Sometimes I don't think we really think of Moses as a prophet, but he was a great prophet, as we'll find out today. And I also think it's interesting that in the religion of Islam, Moses is considered one of the greatest prophets. I mean, second probably to Muhammad. So I thought that was interesting. I think there's some common characteristics among Old Testament prophets, and there are four of them that I would mention to you today. For the most part, prophets were powerful speakers. They didn't write their message down and deliver it written. The message was written at a later date, frequently not even by the prophets themselves. So they were powerful speakers. Uh, sometimes that wasn't a good thing, but we know that God gave them a message to tell the people. Now, we don't think of Moses as a powerful speaker. We remember that he was very hesitant to even take on the role because he said he was not a powerful speaker. And God, as we know, gave him his brother Aaron 
to be his mouthpiece for him, so to speak. But most of the prophets were powerful speakers. I think a second characteristic is that the prophets were judgmental. They were judgmental because God told them to be. The message that God instructed the prophets to, to give, to call out the Israelites, was their bad behavior and what was going to happen to them if they didn't cease their bad behavior. So they were judgmental for the most part. The third characteristic is that they were committed to their role. Uh, they weren't part-time. These guys, for the most part guys and a few ladies, they spent their life being a prophet. Um, I think that wasn't always a pleasant thing for them to do, to continue to harp on someone's behavior and uh, do it full time was really something that uh, probably gave them some pause at times. And the last characteristic I would mention is they knew they were going to be persecuted. When God told them what to say to the Israelites, they knew their message was going to be a very unpopular message. Nobody likes to hear about their bad behavior and what's going to happen to them if they don't shape up. But that was essentially what the prophets were being instructed to do by God. So we'll move from that to Barbara, who's going to tell us about our main character, Moses. I'm sure much of what she will say we have heard before, but it's always good to get a refresher. So Barbara, tell us about Moses. Okay. Moses is one of the most well-known characters in the Bible. As we know, he wrote the first five books of the Bible. But a little bit about his history, he was a Hebrew. He was born to Jochebed and Ammon, both from the tribe of Levi, when the children of Israel lived in Egypt as slaves. He was the youngest of three children with a sister named Miriam and his brother named Aaron. He was a special baby because at this time, Pharaoh was afraid of the Israelite slaves because there's so many of them and he ordered that all the baby boys would be killed. Moses' mother protected them and she kept him hidden for three months. Then when he got so big she couldn't hide anymore, she made a little boat, placed him in it and hid Moses in the reeds on the banks of the Nile River. He didn't stay there long before he was rescued by Pharaoh's daughter. And because she was unable to nurse him, Miriam was watching her and she offered to go get his mother to nurse him. So uh, once he was weaned, he lived in royalty because the Pharaoh's daughter raised him in the palace surrounding by all the luxuries of Egypt. But Moses was a murderer. He grew up in the palace, but he knew he was a Hebrew. When Moses saw the Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave, the Bible said, look him this way and that way and send no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. This wasn't the greatest cover up because the next day a Hebrew slave called him out. So Moses was, even though he was brave, he was still a little bit afraid. Pharaoh found out what Moses had done and tried to kill him. So Moses ran for his life. He lived in the desert of Midian for 40 years. He became a husband to Tharbas and Zipriah and a father to Gushmal and Eliza. Fear showed up again when God appeared to him in the flames of the bush. And he came up with every excuse that he could not to do what God wanted him to do to free the Israelites the slaves. But he was courageous too. So uh, God got Aaron to help him. And through the long story of the 10 plagues and Pharaoh's opposition, he led the Israelites out of Egypt. He was close to God. He spent 40 days with him on Mount Sinai. And he didn't care to speak his mind to God. So uh, I always thought this is so sad. Uh, after leading the Israelites for 40 years and God promised, keeping this promise to him, one day Moses got a little bit angry 
and struck the rock two times to stay waiting for God to let the water come out of the rock. So God didn't allow him to enter the promised land. He took him up there to see the promised land, but he didn't get to go into it. And he lived to be 120 years old, and he was completely healthy. His eyes were not weak, and his strength was not down when he passed away. And this part I did not know. It's just that God actually buried Moses, and no one knows exactly where he's buried at. Very interesting. Okay. Well, Howard is going to tell us about the call of Moses to be a prophet that is given to us in Deuteronomy. Thank you. Before we get to Deuteronomy, though, um, as folks almost all remember, God appeared to Moses, as Barbara said, in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. This is God speaking to Moses. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. So this, this happened on Mount Horeb, um, which is thought to be the same as Mount Sinai. Um, and so then in Deuteronomy, Moses recalls his calling and he tells the people um, that God will call more prophets. And as Barbara mentioned, it, it is long thought that Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy, but modern scholars now think that's probably not the case. Um, and, and so our author um, gives us a little bit of a tip um, in the leader's guide that most scholars have identified the core of Deuteronomy with the book of law that was found in the temple at the time of King Josiah in the 600s BC. Um, and it was likely composed as a book of religious reforms advanced by King Josiah. But the writer put them down as being told by Moses because he was held in, in great high esteem and it sort of represents a revival of the Mosaic teaching as it was understood at that time. Mm -hmm. And so um, Jack will tell us a little bit more in a few minutes about the sermons in Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. um, but in Deuteronomy 18, Moses says the following to the people. You must remain completely loyal to the Lord your God. Although these nations that you are about to dispossess do give heed to soothsayers and diviners, as for you, the Lord your God does not permit you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, if I hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore or ever see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. You may say to yourself, how can we recognize a word that the Lord has not spoken? If a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, but the thing does not take place or prove true, it is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. 
but do not be frightened by it. So God called Moses to be a prophet, and then he told Moses to tell the people, I will call other prophets like Moses um, to speak for me to you in the future. Okay, that's good. Well, the book of Deuteronomy is really a summation of the law of Moses that is found in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And that sort of fits with the description that Howard just gave of maybe this was written actually later uh, and not by Moses. We don't really know. But the setting is this. As Barbara said, Moses was not going to be able to go to the promised land. And here he was, 120 years old. He was going to be forbidden to go into the promised land, but he wanted to make extremely sure that the current generation was ready to go. Let's keep in mind, he was speaking to children's children and maybe even another generation. Over a 40 year period of time, there weren't many of the people who left Egypt still around. So what Moses did or who, whomever wrote this part of Deuteronomy was uh, repeat much of what had already been said in Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers. So theologians break down Deuteronomy into three main sermons given by Moses to the Israelites that were very similar in nature. Uh, in the first sermon, which is the first four chapters, Moses is telling the people that he has appointed judges to help them with his work after he leaves them. Uh, then he moves on to the story of how they got the promised land and how God had sent spies into Canaan to see if it could be conquered. And as we'll remember, everybody but Joshua and Caleb came back and said, no, 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 we can't possibly overpower these people. And as a punishment, they wandered for 40 years. God is reminding the current generation in his first sermon through, through Moses about why they were wandering. Uh, and he finally says that they are to obey God and not make any idols once they enter the promised land. That was his first sermon. The second sermon, Moses begins by going back over the Ten Commandments, and he sums up the Ten Commandments with the statement that there is only one God, and that command is to love that God with all your heart and all your mind. Interesting enough, that's one of the two great commandments that Jesus gives us. So Moses exhorts the current generation to learn these commandments, to live these commandments, and to teach them to their children and their children's children. And then we come into the third sermon. And in the third sermon, Moses again warns the people against disobedience, and he encourages them to obey the Lord and his commandments and calls on them to make a choice between good and evil. And it's interesting to me, really, that that's probably what we're called to do today in many of life's situations is to make a choice between good and evil. So those were interesting commentaries, I thought, on uh, the parts of Deuteronomy that Moses uh, supposedly wrote. So we know that the everything that ties the entire Bible together is God's covenant. And he established that covenant early on. And Barbara's going to talk about this covenant that God established with his people and even today it establishes with us. So Barbara? Okay. In Exodus 20, no, I'm sorry, 19, it says, now, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you'll be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So Moses returned from the mountain and called together the elders of the people and told them everything the Lord had commanded them. And all the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has commanded, 
So Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. Okay. The Old Testament covenant was given at Mount Sinai, and it's also called the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, the covenant is an agreement. Sometimes it's called a testament. And the biblical definition is conditional promises made to humanity by God as revealed in scripture. And then it goes on, they explain about the agreement between God and the ancient Israelites in which God promised to protect them if they kept his law and was faithful to him. There was other covenants that we had already been made. One was Noah and one was Abraham. The mediator in this governor, this covenant was Moses. And he had spent 40 days up on Mount Sinai. And it was between God and his people, the Israelites. The people were to be obedient to the law and the people agreed. It was served to set the nation of Israel apart from all nations as God's chosen people and was as equally binding as the unconditional covenant that God made with Abraham because it was a blood covenant. It is a significant covenant in both God's redemption history and in the history of Israel through whom God chose to bless the world with both the written word and the living word, Jesus Christ, both in Israel. It's important to understand that the Mosaic Covenant differs significantly from the Abraham Covenant and later covenants because it's conditional and that the blessing that God promises are directly related to Israel's obedience to the law. If they are obedient, then God will bless them. But if they disobey, then God will punish them. The other Old Testament covenants are un unilateral covenants. God does what he promises regardless of what the recipient might do. This covenant is different. That is a bilateral because uh, both parties are obligated for the covenant to take place. This is when the people would offer the animal, animal sacrifices to the holy priest. However, this covenant did not promise people new life people could not obey the law perfectly. Then we get to the New Testament covenant is the promise that God makes with humanity that he will forgive sin and restore fellowship with those whose hearts are toward him. Jesus Christ is the mediator of this covenant and his death on the cross is the basis of this promise. In Luke uh, 22, 17 through 20, he says, then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. The new covenant was predicted while the old covenant was still in effect. The Moses, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, were just a few that alluded to it. The new covenant involves a total change of heart so that God's people are naturally pleasing to him. The old covenant was written on stone and the new covenant is written in our hearts. Entering the new covenant is made only by faith in Christ who shed his blood to take away the sins of the world related to the scripture we just read. We're no longer, we are no longer under the law, but under grace. We are given the opportunity to receive salvation as a free gift. Our responsibility is to exercise faith in Christ, the one who fulfilled the law on behalf, on our behalf, and brought it into the law's sacrifice through his own sacrificial death. Through the Holy Spirit who lives in believers, we share the inheritance of Christ and enjoy a permanent 
unbroken relationship with God is promised. In summary, John 3, 16 says it all. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, those, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So, and we renew our covenant each time that we celebrate the Lord's Supper monthly on special occasions. Okay, thanks, Barb. Well, one of the things that is mentioned throughout the Bible is the idea of, and the reality of false prophets. And uh, our writer of our lesson touches on that subject of false prophets. Do they exist today? And Howard is going to talk with us about that subject. Howard? Well, first, <clears throat> let me say this is a very important and a personal subject for me in, in our present society and, and in the church today. Um, I often wonder if I am being a false prophet or following one. So many people are saying so many different things, and most of them seem to be sincere and faithful to what they believe they are hearing from God. So how do we decide what is from God and, and what is a false prophecy? Um, it's certainly not a new issue in the world today. Um, it's been around pretty much since the beginning. In Deuteronomy 13, Moses tells the people that God says, if prophets are those who divine by dreams appear among you and promise you omens or portents, and the omens or the portents declared by them take place. And they say, let us follow other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You must not heed the words of those prophets or those who divine by dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you indeed love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. The Lord your God you shall follow, him alone you shall fear, his commandments you shall keep, his voice you shall obey, him you shall serve, and to him you shall hold fast. And we heard above previously when I read from Deuteronomy 18 um, that if someone prophesies but the thing does not take place or prove true, the word of the Lord has not been spoken. Um, as Jack said, there are many, many references to false prophets throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and others um, talk about false prophets throughout the, the writings that, that they put down. Um, in Matthew 7, at, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will know them by their fruits. Um, in Matthew 24, Jesus goes on to say, And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of the increase of lawless, lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, and this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. In Luke 6, Jesus again says, Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. And then for me, I think one of the most powerful um, New Testament sayings around false prophets is from the disciple John in, in 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. 
every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And so our author points out that even Jesus himself was questioned as a false prophet, and he was crucified by those who he threatened, who were actually the false prophets, <laughs> at least for those of us that, that have faith um, that that is the case. And, and so for me personally, if you ask 100 people, how do they know false prophets today, you'll probably get 100 different answers. Mm -hmm. um, but my personal answer is this. From, from the passages I read above, um, I try to do four things when I'm trying to discern whether a thought, an idea, or a prophecy is truly from God or, or if it is false. And the first is I pray to God about whether I feel right or wrong about it in my heart and my soul. Um, does he give me peace about it? or discomfort. And then secondly, I try to reconcile my heart and my soul with the scriptures. And this is sometimes a very long and painful process as there is no clear consensus mm -hmm. on interpretations or even translations of the scriptures. And so third, as Jesus has advised, I ask myself, what are the fruits? If the fruits demonstrate love for one another and fellowship in the presence of God, then I think it is from God. If the fruits demonstrate judgment, condemnation, or exclusion from fellowship with one another or from God, then I think it's a false prophecy. And so, the fourth thing is I try to keep an open mind and an openness to more prayer, more learning, and more reflections as I grow in my own relationship with God. Very good. Yeah, thanks. Good. Well, folks, that more or less brings our lesson to a close today. Barbara is going to dismiss us with a closing prayer. See you next week. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for Jesus Christ who died for each of our sins. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, and your forgiveness. Please help us to find fulfillment in your presence. Help us to live in such a way that our actions serve as a reflection of that grace and mercy you have given us. Teach us to seek first your kingdom and the life that brings glory to you in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. Next week, we'll be doing lesson number two about Joshua. Right. See you then. See you. Bye. Uh